If you are worried you have Lyme disease or just like the outdoors and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases. Research. Medicine. Health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Hey everybody, this is Robert, and uh, welcome to today's podcast. And we're ready to talk about uh, yet another tapeworm, one that can cause some very serious pathology. That's Tinea solium, the pork tapeworm. Joining me, as always, to offer her expertise is Rosemary Drizdell. Rosemary is a parasitology teacher and author of the book, Parasites, Tales of Humanity's Most Unwelcome Guests. Hi, Rosemary, and welcome back to the show. Hi, Robert, and thanks for having me back. You bet. Well, let's start with a short summary, a few sentences about Tinea solium uh, for a little overview. Right, so Tinea solium is one of the large intestinal tapeworms, perhaps the, the type that we're most familiar with. We talked about Tinea saginata a couple of weeks ago, which is the beef tapeworm, but this one is the pork tapeworm. They're actually very similar in appearance, but Tinea solium is usually a little bit smaller than saginata. Okay, in what countries is uh, T. solium endemic? Well, it's found worldwide, but there are certain places where it's rare, such as Muslim countries, where they don't eat pork, of course, and also in countries where we have good meat inspections, so industrialized nations. But it's it's very common, actually, in Latin America, Africa, and South and Southeast Asia, perhaps even gaining in, in numbers, because in those places... People are tending to eat more meat these days than they have historically, and a lot of people raise their own pigs. Now, can you talk a little bit about this tapeworm's life cycle? Yes, the life cycle is almost exactly like the Tinea saginata life cycle in that the pigs catch the uh, tapeworm by ingesting eggs, which are passed in human stool. So in the pig's intestine, the egg will hatch and the larva will migrate into the pig's muscle tissue and, in, and insist there as a larva and just wait for an unsuspecting human to come along and eat that larva without thoroughly cooking the pork. So once you digest away the meat around the larva, it attaches to the lining of your intestine that's the scolex part of the worm, and starts producing segments that are called proglottids. And the worm gets longer and longer, and the oldest segments start producing eggs, and the life cycle is complete. Okay. And as far as um, transmission to humans, uh, this is via ingesting pork. That's right, undercooked pork. Yeah. Now, how does the morphology of the adult worm compare with the adult Tinea saginata? Very similar. They they would look, you know, to the uh, to the naked eye, the untrained eye, they would look exactly the same. They the Tinea solium scolex is a bit more frightening than saginata. Saginata has four suckers by which it attaches to the lining of the intestine, but solium has also what we call an armed rostellum, so it has a circle of nasty looking little hooks on the top of its head, which helps it to hang on. The proglottids, the segments, look exactly the same unless you can see their internal structure, which we might be able to do under a microscope or by holding them up to the light. And they just have a slightly different internal structure in that the saginata has what we call a tree-like uterus with lots of branches. And solium looks the same but has simply fewer branches in the proglottid. And how about the egg stage? How does the... Tinea solium compared to saginata? To the untrained trained eye, again, exactly the same. And in fact, we can't distinguish between the two species of eggs without doing some kind of molecular testing or having the proglottid or the scolex to help us with that. Right. So what are the signs and symptoms of T. solium infection? 
If you just have a worm in your intestine, you may not have any symptoms at all, actually. You might have some abdominal discomfort. You might lose a little weight, have a poor appetite, maybe some nausea, insomnia. But many people don't have any symptoms and don't know that they have a pork tapeworm until perhaps they notice that they've passed a segment or are diagnosed because of some other related uh, disease. Okay. Um, however, there's a, a condition called cystocercosis um, that's associated with teniosolium. Can you talk about that, uh, Rosemary? That's right, and that's what I was alluding to when I mentioned the other disease. In the, the life cycle of teniosolium is different from saginata in that if you were to accidentally swallow the eggs, you would become, in a sense, an accidental pig, so that larva would hatch, migrate into your tissues, and and then live there. And, of course, humans don't normally get eaten, so that would be a, a dead end to the life cycle of that worm. And often, if you only have a few, or even if they're just in the muscles of the body, this isn't really a big deal, but unfortunately, they do tend to also go to the nervous tissue and sometimes to the eyes, in which case it's a much worse problem. Right. So to be clear, uh, you really can't get sister psychosis from eating tainted pork. It's via you have to eat the egg. That's right. You have to eat the egg. Yes. And of course, you could eat eggs that are being produced by your own tapeworm, or you could swallow eggs that are being produced by somebody else's tapeworm. Right. Um, how is uh, uh, tania solium infection treated? We can treat the presence of the adult worm in the intestine with praziquantel. It gets a bit more complicated with cystocercosis, and every case would be, would be considered on its own merits. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to treat cystocercosis, especially if it's not causing any major problems. One of the issues being that our immune system kind of uh, has a treaty with those live larvae, and it's not until after the larvae die that you start getting some symptoms. So it doesn't make sense then to step in and kill the larvae because that can just cause problems. If they're in locations in the brain where they are causing things like seizures or perhaps aphasia, loss of the ability to speak, that kind of thing, it depends on where they are located in the brain. Sometimes surgery is the right solution. Um, and sometimes they choose to treat with praziquantel or albendazole. Albendazole might be a little better. Studies don't necessarily agree on that. Um, how about prevention and control of this parasite? Like so many, so many parasites, it depends on good sanitation. For the individual, if you're in an area where you think you might pick it up, of course you're going to cook your pork well. If you're trying to avoid cystocercosis, you're going to make sure your water is clean, your vegetables are washed and well cooked, and that you're really good at uh, washing your hands. In a lot of places, unfortunately, you know, pigs will eat anything, and I mentioned that people keep their own pigs. So it's very convenient in places where there's poor sanitation to actually get rid of sewage and human waste by feeding it to your pigs which of course you know feeds right into the life cycle of the worm so in places like Latin America and Africa many of the pigs will be infected and even if there is a good meat inspection people often know that their pigs are infected because you can tell they get the little larvae in their tongues and apparently you can feel them so they will then rather than lose the value of the pig they'll sell it on the black market or in, by some unofficial route so these pigs still get eaten. So it's it's a problem that way. Gotcha. Okay, and to close, Rosemary, what uh, amazing tale do you have to share with us today? Well, as you can imagine, there's lots of interesting tales about tinea solium, and it's hard to pick one, but I did think about the um, interesting outbreak in New York in the early 1990s where a group of Orthodox Jews came down with neurocystocercosis, which is where you have the, the larvae in your brain. And of course, these people don't eat pork, and none of them had any relevant travel history. It was turning up in both children and adults. And so epidemiologists were a little puzzled as to where that pork tapeworm was coming from and how it got into that community. 
When they looked, they found that at least 400 or 450 actually Orthodox Jews in that community had antibodies to tinea solium. So there was quite a high rate of exposure, or there were no pigs and there were no obvious tapeworms. Mm. But it turned out that many of the household help people that these uh, Orthodox Jews were hiring as housekeepers, as cooks, and to look after their children were immigrants from Latin America, and they had brought tapeworms with them. And uh, the eggs were being accidentally ingested by people in the households. Oh, interesting. I didn't hear about that one. Yeah, it was quite a good piece of epidemiological work. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you once again, Rosemary Drizdell. I appreciate you joining me for this short talk. Always my pleasure. Thank you.